It's wonderful to have you here. We had over 300 people register for this event, which is wonderful for a, a noontime uh, get-together. So welcome. Uh, this is a first for us, as you may have noticed, and I hope you took a few minutes to look at the photographs, the wonderful photographs by Doug Minuet downstairs. And uh, we're going to have this until September the 7th. So this is the grand opening day, and we're delighted that all of you are here. I want to just make clear that um, we have... Uh, a, a great new sponsor uh, as the result of this collaboration we put together with Doug for Fearless Genius. It's Micron Technology. This is uh, Micron's return to the valley after quite an absence, but they're now starting to uh, rebuild their presence here, and we're so delighted that Micron stepped forward and, uh, and saw this as the wonderful event, which we all have seen it being. So thank you very much to Micron for making that possible. Doug Minuet is a very accomplished author and photographer, and he has done so much important work all over the world in a variety of important fields. Today we focus on this incredible project that he did called Fearless Genius, the Digital Revolution in Silicon Valley, 1985 to 2000. When he was a brilliant uh, young photographer here in Silicon Valley in 1985, he met Steve Jobs just as Steve was starting over after leaving Apple. And in an extraordinary act of trust, Steve allowed Doug special access to photograph him as he began the next chapter in his professional life, which was, of course, called Next. And once Silicon Valley heard that Doug Minuet had been given unlimited access to Steve Jobs behind the scenes, all the doors began to open. And he photographed more than 70 other leading companies in the valley. He got behind the scenes on Sand Hill Road and in Venture Capital. He went to the things that used to happen before we had days like Y Combinator when startup ideas were being pitched to investors and rode that right through to the internet boom of the 1990s up to the year 2000 when he concluded that work just as the dot-com bubble was collapsing and a singular era in our history was ending. He generated 250,000 images from those 15 years of work. And what you see downstairs is 50 of his most wonderful and carefully curated images. There are many more wonderful images in the book. Fearless Genius has been traveling since its debut in 2012. It's been to Barcelona. It's been to China. Uh, it's been to other interesting parts of the, of the world. And now it returns home to Silicon Valley. This is its only West Coast stop, and it will be Doug's only personal appearance. So we're delighted to have him here today, here to talk about the story of Fearless Genius. Please join me in welcoming Doug Minuet. Thank you so much, John, for that beautiful introduction, and thank you all for coming today. It's terrifying to be here in, in the belly of the beast, as it were. You guys all live this history. Um, but I, as a naive witness, I'm going to tell you a little bit of what I saw. I'm going to take you back now to a simpler place in time, to Silicon Valley, before the internet, before Facebook, before texting. It was the age of the beeper. The fax was cool. It was during the digital revolution when a secretive tribe of brilliant engineers, entrepreneurs, and venture capitalists came together sparked an explosion of innovation that rocked our world. They proved that the power of creative ideas can become reality, given enough guts, willpower, and sheer passion. Along the way, they created millions of jobs and untold wealth. Then my project looks at challenges we face to innovation today, particularly around education with a shortage of engineers, and the trend to short-term investment. There's not a lot of patient money for really tough problems like solving climate change today. And if we're not doing that, are we really as innovative as we think we are or were? Um, before I address that heretical question, let me take you back to how I got to Silicon Valley. I was an outsider. I wasn't particularly interested in tech. It was about people and culture. But in 1985, I was a young photojournalist covering the famine in Ethiopia. I had been a news photographer for some time and had seen an, an, a number of horrific things, a lot of death, but this was on a scale that was just incomprehensible. You'd walk into a camp with 100,000 people and almost all of them were dying. I shot around the world for time in Newsweek and Life, but I just was just overwhelmed by this and began to question my own role and how I could contribute something meaningful. 
I went back to the Bay Area and I started to think about trying to find a story that would be more hopeful for the human race and for meaning in my own life. That same year, Steve Jobs was forced out at Apple. From the height of fame and power, he hit bottom. And he announced he was going to build a supercomputer that would transform education. I knew from my work that education was the key to so many social issues. That got my attention. Through friends, I reached out and I asked if I could document Steve and his team building the next computer from the early days to shipping and capture his process of innovation. And I wanted complete access and I wanted to do it for Life magazine. Amazingly, Steve agreed. Of course, being Steve, he was already thinking about this. My timing was good. I stayed three years, and as John said, Steve blessed me with his trust, and I was able to go through the valley and expand my project after three years and cover most of the leading innovators in over 70 companies, and I shot a lot of film, a lot of startups, and now that, that material is at Stanford Library, where it's being preserved as a resource, and that's why with the scanning we've done, we can bring you now the Fearless Genius book and this exhibition. We're trying to do a documentary now and uh, an education program and continue this as to share and celebrate the history of what happened during those days and bring those lessons forward to today's entrepreneurs. I'm going to begin with Steve where I began, and I'm going to share a number of stories with you today, but this is, uh, th this is where I started with Steve Jobs. We all know about his great success, but most people outside the valley don't know about the 10 years of struggle and failure he went through in the wilderness. One day, you know, we were talking and they, had, they were trying to put the power of a mainframe in a one-foot cube. Difficult. The prototype came and I asked Steve, we were looking at the prototype and I just innocently said, so what are you going to do with this cube anyway, Steve? And he wheeled on me and he said, I want some kid at Stanford to cure cancer in his dorm room. You know, and the look in his eye, I realized the power he had because I believed it was possible because he seemed to believe it was possible and his team believed it. Everyone wanted to be on that bus to the future. This is the day Ross Perot came in to give Steve $20 million to fund Next. He'd started with $6 million of his own money and he said to the team, hey, let's go to this abandoned warehouse where we're going to build this factory and do this formal lunch pitch. And he told Ross, we're going to build the world's most advanced robotic assembly line. No human hands will touch the We'll sell 10,000 computers a month. Ross wrote the check. This is the early days of the company. Almost everyone in the company is in the picture. And Steve is saying, he's interrupting his presentation. And he's saying, hey, everybody, let's work nights and weekends till Christmas. And then we'll take a week off. This engineer in the back raises his hand and says, um, Steve, we already are working nights and weekends. One of my favorite people and heroes from those days is Susan Kerr, who designed the icons for the Macintosh. She became a creative director at Next. She went on to design the icons, redesign the icons for Windows, and then OS2, and she did General Magic and many, many devices. So her work affects the lives of millions of people every day, yet very few people know who she is. She's one of the unsung women of the valley that I came across. Those of you who recognize the handwriting, this is a Steve Jobs to-do list. I like the last item. For those of you who can't read, ankle deep shit. This stuff is hard. It's hard. He was a dreamer too, and he was able to pull together these disparate ideas into one and find something to, to push toward. That, that was, it was like watching an artist in that regard, although he had other attributes, as you all know. I, have been blessed in my career, as John said. You know, I've been to the North Pole, I crossed the Sahara, I've been up the Amazon, I photographed presidents and movie stars, and had lots of experiences. And by the time I got to Steve, I'd had many life and death experiences. And yet, somehow, being in the room with him was terrifying, because even though he had blessed me and given me this access, I knew that one day, he would turn to me and I would have to justify my existence. Just like everyone else in the room. Everyone had to be on their A game, the best in the world, so I had to figure out who I was. I had to figure out what I believed in and what I was doing there. You know, photojournalists want to take pictures that can improve the world, that can reveal injustice and change lives. I was willing to die for a photo that could do that, as were my peers. But then I realized, oh, well, these people are changing the world. They're actually changing the world, and I can shoot them. That became my purpose. I felt useful. And after that, Steve was a lot easier. 
ish. <laughs> Another one of my heels, this is Dan Alou and talking with Jeff Bork. Steve had just walked over to Dan at an offsite and said, listen, do you think in 20 minutes you could prepare a plan to sell 10,000 computers a month and support that with all the employees and everything? And it's, a, you know, get it ready in about 25 minutes. They called it Plan 1 Billion and he did it. You rarely saw Steve in an unguarded, unself-conscious moment, so I'm very proud of that. I call this Steve Jobs pretending to be human. <laughs> Seriously, what's, who's he kidding? What I observed with Steve was that it was all about trust in many ways. If an engineer presented an idea, he had to know that person had worked day and night for a year and was willing to die for that idea. Potentially, in a startup, any decision risks the company. If someone presented something and he didn't feel it was right, or he didn't agree, or he just didn't like that person for whatever reason, he could explode and he'd start attacking. This is stupid. This is the stupidest idea I've ever seen. I'm editing for prime time. <laughs> if the engineer was mature and evolved and had, had done their homework, they would just calmly respond, no, Steve, it's not stupid. No, you're wrong, Steve. No, no, it's not stupid. No, no, it's not stupid. No, it's really good. This would go back and forth. Maybe five minutes, 10 minutes, could seem like an eternity. Suddenly a flip would switch and Steve would just go, oh, okay, great. And he'd smile that beautiful smile and he'd go on to the next victim. It was amazing to watch. And I'm not condoning bad behavior, but somehow he was able to marshal these brilliant, brilliant scientists to, to, to do what he wanted and, and go against the laws of physics as they often reminded him and create the impossible. Pow. Jumping ahead, this is the spring of 1989. Steve has now burned through most of his personal fortune. He's got 50 million into Pixar and 50 into Next. The company's on the ropes. They've announced it with this lavish launch, which we all know about these launches, but it's now the spring and they haven't built a single computer. They don't even have the factory or the robots. He arranges a meeting with Canon. This is the chairman of Canon and his team. And Canon wants to invest. Steve's asking for $100 million and a bunch of stuff. And he's heard that they want to only give him 50 and they want double the equity he wants to give. And he comes into the meeting wearing a sweater vest. Right off the bat, he starts off in an awkward note. This is the 80s. Japan was ascendant. He wasn't showing the proper respect. He sits down and he starts making six ridiculous, unreasonable demands that were not on the agenda. It took about an hour and a half for him to get through these. Everyone is baffled. Finally, the chairman of Canon says, I need a break. He goes out of the room. Steve turns to his team. You guys have fucked up this deal. Steve storms out of the room, and we're like, what, what just happened? People looking at me like I know. John Eisen is out in the hall, and he told me 20 years later what happened out there. He said, Steve was laughing in the hallway. And John went up to him and said, Steve, why aren't you in there saving our jobs? And Steve goes, oh, I just made all these ridiculous demands, and I'm going to go on wind and watch. And he goes in the room, and one by one, he fights for about another hour and a half, and Cannon has now come back like, like Germany against Brazil. <laughs> and they are crushing the mighty Steve Jobs one after another. And finally, yay, Cannon has won on all six points. But in that moment, the power shifted right back across the table to Steve. He got the hundred million, and he got the robots he promised Ross Perot. Going backwards now, this is Steve's office before the launch. Secrecy was paramount even then. This is Ross at Educom. So they did this fantastic launch. It was enormous, a huge success, 80 magazine covers. Uh, most people didn't know the prototype was running. I think it was running on a Sun workstation backstage. It wasn't really running. Um, <laughs> One time, Ross and I were standing, we were in a group watching Steve, and Steve had a problem with somebody, and he was going off on somebody, he was yelling at somebody about 30 feet away, and everyone is just standing there watching awkwardly. Ross leans over and whispers in my ear, well now, Steve reminds me of myself when I was 30. <laughs> but then I learned you catch more flies with honey. Despite the failure of the next hardware and having to close the factory and lay off 300 people with Steve's head down on the table, he never gave up on the operating system. He kept developing the next OS for years. And that's laid the seeds of his redemption and ultimate comeback. Taking a deep breath, 
I heard they were doing this cool thing at Adobe called Photoshop. Photographer, I thought that'd be interesting. I, got, I went over there and I got involved and I started to document. You know, you had um, 500 years of printing history from Gutenberg to Adobe and then bang, desktop publishing changes the world. And these two gentlemen, two true fearless genius, Chuck Geschke and John Warnock, spent 20,000 man hours writing the code that describes uh, letter forms and connects computers to printers, the page description language called PostScript that they renamed PostScript and launched Adobe. Their original business plan was not to do desktop publishing, it was to sell you an Alta-like computer with a printer. Okay, this is symbolic. If they were gonna have sex, this is how they would have. It felt like Paris in the 20s must have felt because as this technology, as Moore's law caught up and the processing power actually allowed desktop publishing to become real, artists started to appear in the valley from all over the world. Artists want to find the cutting edge tool. And this is David Hockney, the great painter, taking the very first Photoshop class, the Photoshop Invitational. I felt like I was discovering a hidden tribe with their own culture and a new language they were developing to go with this new technology. And Russell Brown was kind of one of the ringleaders. This is the creative director of Adobe today, and he was back then. And I think one of the key reasons that Photoshop was adopted and successful was he was able to evangelize to the artists, to designers, to photographers, and get them to try it. He also really loves costumes. I got a call from Keith Yamashita, at, who had gone from next to Apple, and he said, we're doing this really cool handheld device called the Newton. It's a computing device that also a communication device. You should come over. I got a meeting with John Scully and I asked for permission to document the team. I told him what I had done with Steve and I wanted to do the whole thing with Next and his team, I mean with the Newton and his team. And he agreed. It was like a rebel unit that he had funded inside the mothership. Nobody wanted the Newton at Apple. It was all about the Mac at that time. But he saw the Mac uh, was starting to lose market share and he wanted to develop new revenue stream from some new product that could break open a new market. You know, Steve gets kind of a, I mean, John gets kind of a bad rap because after Steve was forced out, um, you know, he's criticized constantly for doing that and for being a marketing guy. But you know, after Steve left, John grew the company from 800 million to $8 billion. And at the time he left, Apple was the most profitable computer company in the world, 91, 92, 93, more than IBM, more than any software company than Microsoft. Um, but they were having trouble rewriting the OS and innovating. And that's what the Newton was about. It was a pretty high-risk gamble. John also put a lot of women in positions, executive positions at Apple that I hadn't seen a lot of in the Valley in those days. There was a woman in charge of manufacturing and software. And this woman, Sarah Clark, had her baby and rarely left the building. And this is also about the changing culture in the Valley in those days. But that's commitment. She would sleep while the code was compiling and breastfeed behind a curtain. And it kind of raises the issue, why is, why is diversity important? Why does it matter? Is it, is it social justice? Of course. But it also is whoever writes the code controls the machine, which impacts the user behavior and the wider culture. If the people who write the code have different priorities, features are different, the product is different, and I think it's better. The team was burning out, they were wearing down. They were given a year to write a million lines of code with only 30 engineers. And they did it, but at the end of that year, there was a decision made to switch the chip, which was a good decision, but they went back to the team and they said, you have to rewrite that whole million lines. We'll give you another year. Koei Sono, 27 years old, was working day and night to get the inker to work. He had just gotten married. When he heard this, he went home, he loaded a pistol, and he shot himself in the heart, which was just beyond devastating for the team and for all of us. Um, and you know, when I go around doing this talk, it's just so interesting. People outside the Valley just do not realize the level of sacrifice that is made to create these products we all take for granted. But the team rallied. Over Christmas, Michael Chow, who now runs iPad, and, and Steve Capps, and some others gathered together, and they made some technical breakthroughs that allowed them to meet the date for shipping. And the shipping, they shipped the Newton, and it was a triumph of, uh, it was, a, it was a, a catharsis, an emotional release, and they dedicated the product to Co. 
But it shipped too soon. Next shipped too late, Newton shipped too soon, the handwriting was only 95%, there were other reasons. And John Scully was forced out himself, left the company. But his vision for the Newton and, and the team's vision for the Newton that he believed in was vindicated. He had been laughed, off, laughed at when he announced at CES that you know, there'd be millions and billions of handheld smartphone type devices. And it turned out that Newton paved the way in many ways for the, the ultimately the, the, the pilot took the space, but then you had the Palm Pilot, but then you had the iPhone and the iPad, which I actually have a picture in the book of an iPad form factor, which was a Newton designed in 93 by Johnny Ive. Without investors, you get nothing. You have no technology. And without really smart, idealistic investors, you don't get to change the world. And if you were a young entrepreneur in those days, this was one of the rooms you wanted to be in making your elevator pitch with John Doerr and the team at Kleiner Perkins. You know, the, some of the companies Kleiner did that, and well, Genentech and Compaq and Sun and AOL and Netscape and Twitter, Google and At Home and there's many, many other. Very few companies had as many success stories, but they were patient backers. And they, and they you know, Amazon took five years to make a profit. I think that's an important point today. Bill Joy, another one of the actual geniuses that I photographed who wrote Berkeley Unix, co-founded Sun, is uh, he's kind of explaining the backbone of the internet. This is 1992, and that's William Randolph Hearst III. Bill told me that night in 92 that I had to get a website, and I was like, what's that? You know, Tim Berners-Lee had just released the web a year before, and I don't know how many of you know this, but um, I've asked this question a lot. How, how, what did Tim Berners-Lee use to develop the World Wide Web and the linking, hyperlinking and all that? And it was the next computer. This is Bill Gates saying, no one should ever pay more than $50 for a photo. Thanks a lot, Bill. <laughs> he was a devil then. Many of you remember. He's an angel now. Gotta love him. This is Intel's most advanced fab at the time, the Pentium fab in New Mexico. And these are workers taking a break, doing an exercise break. And many of these workers are actually Pueblo Indians. Ed Catmill, just after Toy Story was released. Andreas Bechtelsheim, a great engineer who co-founded Sun. And probably if you want to compete with Sun, you shouldn't show your motherboard on display. But I don't know that much about it, but. <laughs> Bill Joy finishing Java in his office in Aspen, which was a big deal for Sun. 10,000 people are having a water fight down below, but I was really interested in this <laughs> boys in their toys sculpture. This is not a strategic map. These are the golf courses Scott McNeely wants to play. <laughs> you know, it was a lot of fun. I loved it. The great archetype in the valley is that the visionary leader is forced out. And Samir Arora and his team at NetObjects, he broke that mold. But he was one of the last, he was the last company at NetObjects that I spent a lot of time with at the end of the dot-com cycle. They created the first software that let anybody, any idiot, create the, a web page. In 95, 96, when they came out, the browser wars were going on. It was a classic startup. And this is what you'd find some mornings after an all-night programming session. Other source material for engineers might include pizza, ho-hos, and uh, Coca-Cola. It was fun. You had to wear a balloon hat if you were new. But time was running out. The, a couple of employees disagreed with the strategy. And they went behind Samir's back to the board. And the board, the investors, decided that it was time for Samir to go. And in this meeting, they were supposed to close a round, an investment round. And everybody was really excited about that. And it turned out that the meeting had a different agenda, which was, Samir, you're fired. Sign here. You get your shares. We're replacing you. We're moving in a new direction. Front pages in the market. And thanks a lot for your service. And Samir was like, well, I'm not going. Screw you. I'm not doing it. Um, I have a vision for this. And I'm going to fight for my vision. There was a long, long argument and battle. They left. They shut the company down, and at 5 o'clock, he had to go before his 125 employees, and he asked, whoever can stay and work without pay, please stay. I'm going to fix this. He went home, and he began dialing for dollars. 
And by noon the following Monday, he had $10 million in the bank. It was amazing to do without lawyers or due diligence. The best part of the story is three months later, he sold the company to IBM for $100 million. He brought back the investors into the deal and they made 1,000% IRR. He is, his story draws together so many of the threads of the classic entrepreneur in Silicon Valley. And now he's doing Glam, which is now called Mode, and very successful. There's a slight caveat to the story that a year later when IBM took the company public, the market was becoming very nervous. The bubble was huge. It was March of 99, so their IPO was not a huge success. Um, actually, CNN came on and asked, is this the beginning of the end of the dot-com bubble? And it, and it was, because there were 400 IPOs, something like that, that year, and they all were pretty flat, and they just kept getting worse and worse, so that by March of 2000, trillions of dollars started to wash away. And it was devastating. And anyone, all of you who've lived through it, will never forget it. It was amazing. But for me, it was really tragic in many ways, too, because you know, I came in and was very attracted to what people called the noble cause, what Steve called the noble cause. And this idealism that people would say, I want kids in Africa to have computers, and they really meant it. And that shifted to by 2000, where people would actually say to me, well, we don't have a product yet, but we're doing our IPO, we'll be rich. And that was unsustainable, and it crashed. Meanwhile, while Silicon Valley is crashing, Steve Jobs is rising back up like a rocket to glory and fame and rebuilding Apple. It was the OS that he never gave up on, and he kept fighting for that. He never, ever gave up that saved him and allowed Apple to transform itself back into an amazing company because Apple bought the next OS. An interesting side note is that the reason John Scully was fired is primarily because he wouldn't agree to license the Mac OS. Most people don't talk about that. He was forced out, and all his projections showed that if they did that, the company would be bankrupt in three years. Well, anyway, they licensed the Mac OS, and three years later, they were close to bankruptcy. And the one thing they did to save the company was they sold this chip company that Scully had invested in called Arm for the Newton. So John said to me recently, how much money do you think Newton made for Apple? And I said, um, zero? <laughs> he said, no, $850 million. That's what they sold ARM for, of which they used 450 or 400, whatever it was, to buy the, the next OS. So it's an interesting Shakespearean backstory. So I want to leave you with a couple of thoughts that I've been thinking about. It's scary, I know. Um, the hive mind, you know, the singularity is probably coming. Computers will gain consciousness, I believe that. And whether you think that's really cool or utterly terrifying, I just would like to have a public dialogue about it. That atom bomb thing didn't work out so great, and nobody asked me if I wanted to type with my thumbs on tiny keyboards. Who thought that was good? <laughs> We're definitely not going to get a vote to see if we want to upload our brains into a hive mind. You know, if anything in the future is possible, how do we build and choose the best possible future? I agree with Bill Joy, there should be public dialogue. Second, there's big challenges we face in education. There are millions of unfilled STEM jobs. You guys know it better than anybody, the shortage of engineers. So who will be the next Steve Jobs? And where will she come from? Well, she could come from anywhere. There's a whole new crop of cool kids coming up worldwide. But unless we improve our education system and really address this issue, there's, there's, she's probably going to have a really hard, team, a hard time She's going to have a hard time fielding a really cool team here in the US. A couple of years ago, we graduated fewer doctorates of computer science than in 1970. It's crazy to me. And third, I'm curious, why are so many investments today so short term? Everybody wants their money out in 18 months. Since the dot-com crash, this seems to be institutionalized. And naturally, this has led to innovation that you can do in the short term. Apps. And apps are cool. I love my apps. And there's tons of really exciting innovation today, but it is all iterative. Uh, most of everything we use today was invented in the 80s and 90s or 70s or before. And actually, that's natural because we're at the end of this 25, 30 year cycle, as I understand it. And so the stuff is maturing and it's really actually starting to be functional. The stack is integrated. But it's really hard for big, risky ideas to get funded. Nobody out there is really taking too, there's just not a lot of money for stuff, like I said earlier, for like climate change. And you know, Judy Estrin says there's this um, 
there was a natural break put on innovation after 2000 because of this shift in the investment strategy. The long-term thinking just isn't there. It's not supported by Wall Street, certainly. Which makes me ask the question, can you think of a single innovation since 2000 here in the US that has scaled up to create millions of jobs here with benefits, full-time jobs, as happened during the digital revolution? And I can't think of one. And if you're thinking of selling things online, I think that's exciting and that's growing. And there's other things that are growing. There's tons of things that could scale, but nothing has really scaled to help grow the middle class yet and create real meaningful jobs. You know, selling baskets online for one year, 30 grand with no health insurance, that's not going to grow the middle class that buys the products, I don't think. But <laughs> not to go negative on you, <laughs> the good news is there's a huge new wave of stuff coming. We're at the knee of Moore's Law, as they say. You know, whether it's sensors, genomics, biotech is incredible, you know, nanotech and 3D printing and quantum computing, all this stuff is coming and you can see it. You can feel it just like you could in the 80s. It's going to explode and a whole new crop of idealistic young innovators and entrepreneurs is coming with it. The question is, how do we catch that next wave? So, just to leave you with this, the people I photographed, they were on a mission. They wanted to create tools that would improve our lives. And why is it important to have a mission and be part of something bigger than yourself? Because inventing new technology is ridiculously breathtakingly hard, as I saw. You have to believe in something deeply to walk through that fire. You don't have to be a genius, but you do have to be fearless. Many of you have already had a tremendous impact on our world here today. And some of you are on your own quests striving to create something amazing. And if you succeed, you could change our lives. What you do matters. The fearless genius story that I'm telling you, this is your story. This is your tribe. Let's go catch that next wave to the future next revolution. Let's fight for the biggest ideas, the toughest problems, and fulfill the promises of the last revolution. Thank you so much. Um, with 250,000 images that you had captured during this period, when does the narrative start to emerge for you? As you were taking the photographs, did you have an idea of what you wanted to say, or did you just have to set this aside for a while and let it germinate a bit? Well, I was so burned out on the valley by 2000 that I just put it in boxes and we began plans to move to New York. <laughs> um, so I didn't think about it at that time. But later when Stanford came into the picture and we started to think about what to do with this and think about a book and other things, then I began to realize there was a natural narrative already. You had an inciting incident with Steve being forced out, which was the beginning of my story. And his arc starts here and goes all the way down and then rises. And I had the rise of Silicon Valley where you had you know, money pouring in like a fire hose on, you know, of gasoline on a fire. So, you know, that was a wonderful twin arc story that ends in 2000 in that sense. So, um, while I was shooting it, it became apparent to me that they were going to probably succeed in many cases. Most of the companies I photographed failed, but I could see that the passion and the energy and the idealism was going to lead to real changes. And I would go back to New York and tell my editors at Newsweek or Time, you're going to have a computer on your desk. And they would just laugh, you know. You're going to have a digital camera. They thought it was insane. But um, you could see it was coming. You could see the future through their eyes, and I believed in it. So it took, it took some time to create uh, the narrative. And by the way, we only have scanned 8,000 images. Mm -hmm. We only had funding for that much. So we've mm -hmm. got so many other stories in here. I have, you know, many, many companies, and there's Bob Noises in there somewhere, and David Packard, and all these great people are in there. I showed you guys just a tiny, tiny wow. teaser. So we're hoping to continue this and dig out stuff that might be useful case studies of different companies, especially some startups that were really interesting, like Go, that failed. Mm. When did the doors first start to open for you after you had begun the project with, with Steve and had gotten inside Next? It, it was a little bit um, interesting. I got calls from people actually saying, hey, we're doing cool stuff too. You know, we want you to do for us what you're doing for Steve. And actually get calls from CEOs. So, I started to accept commissions where I would go in and I said, you know, I would shoot whenever I wanted. I wanted to have full access to the boardroom R&D lab. 
And other times I would go in for Time or Newsweek or I'd go in on my own and ask because I had heard about something cool. Um, and, then, and so a combination of things happened and people would hear about me. But it really came down to trust because even in those days the Valley was locked tight with security and competition was really fierce. It's no different. So having that, uh, the ability to say that Steve trusted me, and, and by the way, you know, everybody, I, I would be at Adobe and the board would be having a meeting about a lawsuit against Effie Arazi, and then I would drive from there over to Effie's, hmm. and they would be planning the counter suit. Hmm. And I never told anybody about it until just now. <laughs> <laughs> so I was trustworthy. I yeah. proved my trust. I, that had to mean everything to the people you were photographing. I proved it. And, and now I think the, the support is there to try to create sense out of that time, because there's lessons that we can bring out of the passion of those days to young entrepreneurs today. Yeah, yeah. I think. <laughs> was, it the, was it the passion that you first locked onto? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm a romantic. <laughs> and I think most of the people that I was attracted to here were crazy people who had, a, you know, we were talking earlier, Steve Jobs, people talk about his reality distortion field. Anyone who ever did anything great in Silicon Valley had a reality distortion field. Yeah. They all were. Because they were so singular minded yeah. about the way that they were going after it. Against all evidence to the contrary, you had to believe your idea would succeed, even as you're going over the cliff somehow. So that attracted me. Yeah. I just was, I, I like, I, you know, I learn about who I am in my place in the world from photographing people around me. Yes. And, and it's just somehow become a mission for me to tell stories to other people about what this culture is doing. And, and then we all learn and can grow. One of the questions that I've been asked most about from people who've seen a bit of the show already is why Sand Hill Road? Why venture capital? Why did you choose to go behind those doors too? Yeah, because I knew nothing about technology to start, and I knew no, less than nothing about finance. I was an artist that became a photojournalist. And um, typically, people like me wouldn't want to have anything to do with the money guys, you know, the suits and all that. Well, these people clearly had the power. And the smarts, they're brilliant, brilliant people. They, had, they reminded me of the Medicis, of the Renaissance movers and shakers. This was a renaissance. And you just, you, if you hung around here and you talked to people, you saw how smart people were. It was, a, it was an everyday exciting education. And the finance people were the, were the smartest of the smart in many ways, you know, um, because they had emotional intelligence. A lot of the engineers were focused on a technical pro project. So the finance people were more well-rounded and they were very interesting and they were, they were lubricating the whole thing. Um, but it actually began because I got an assignment to shoot John Doerr for Time Magazine. Um, Hmm. in, I think, 85 or something. And that was my introduction. And John was such an interesting, just obviously brilliant man and very generous. And he brought me into Kleiner and asked me to shoot some things. And then once I got in there, I just was, I just was amazed at how it worked and how you built a company. And I was, I was learning. You know, I was shooting term sheets for Amazon over their shoulders, not knowing what a term sheet was. You know? hmm. <laughs> um, so I just, I just think... Everyone plays a role here, and you have to have the right balance in that role and the right incentives to create great stuff that's breakthrough, that's sustainable. I like to look back to that time where things were more about long term. It wasn't all that quarterly profit every quarter or getting it, making a hockey stick business plan that's 18 months. It's, it's ridiculous mm. uh, to me. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, why black and white? That's one of the questions from oh, the audience. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Um, Believe it or not, some of you might know this, but USA Today came out in 81. By 1985, when I proposed this story to Life magazine, everything was color. We were going to color. So black and white was kind of exotic and new and radical idea. But it was also the tradition I grew up in. I studied black and white. I didn't shoot color until I was like 21. I started it you know, when I was 10, taking oh. pictures. So for me, that was important. The other reason was technical. Shooting in fluorescent lit rooms, people staring at computer screens where nothing ever happens, it's all in here. Black and white became a way to deal with light, the lack of light, but also black and white strips away the color and you get to the emotion faster. So you start to see what people are feeling because this is so cerebral, this world. And the emotions are very deep, it's like a volcano. 
And actually, any time I saw some, every once in a while, some human emotion would erupt across the room, and I'd be running up there, because most of the time I was waiting for hours for anything for to happen. For just anything to happen. It was yeah. horrible. <laughs> it was really horrible. You know, I had done stakeouts of drug dealers and Russian spies, and you know, I'd stand in the freezing rain for hours waiting for something. So I was trained like a ninja for this. So was, <laughs> I met my match in Silicon Valley. <laughs> Talk a little bit, uh, you mentioned it at the beginning, but you, but you didn't talk about it much in the presentation. Talk about the documentary and what the docu documentary consists of and, mm -hmm. and, and what you hope to achieve with that. I'm really excited because I have found in the video part of this, in the interviews, layers of meaning and information I was so surprised that I didn't know. You know, I was in the room watching these deals go down and I was privileged to see that, but I only saw one level. And so now I'm interviewing people that were in a particular meeting and you're getting this almost like Rashomon. You have three or four points of view. And it just layers and textures the history and you can start to see it's gray area. It's not binary, it's not black and white. And uh, even though I shot him black and white. So, so what I'm hoping to do is we're going back and we're interviewing a lot of the people that survived <laughs> And then we're looking to the future. So the first two thirds of the film, you know, we validate the history and what happened in the 80s and 90s and why is that period important to today? But the last 20 minutes, it's all about what's coming next in the future. Mm. So we're really interested in looking forward and then we're gonna try to do this TV web series that is all about the future. So um, I've kind of gone down the rabbit hole of entrepreneurism with this. Yeah. Because uh, I- And are you happy with that? Because it's hard. Yeah. <laughs> I photographed these people, so I thought I could do this, but it's, it's going along. Uh, you know, we're getting there. The book is done. This exhibit I was telling you this morning, if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, I feel like I'd be happy if I'm dead because I have this exhibit at the Computer History Museum. <laughs> We've got to keep you from getting, that's very nice. Thank you. We've got to keep you from getting hit by a bus, though. Thank you, Joe. Uh, yeah, my wife would appreciate it. A lot of great work <laughs> still to go. Uh, are you, so when you're starting these conversations for the people you're interviewing, and by the way, we have a bit of the documentary running yes. in the exhibit downstairs. Rough so cuts. when you when you see the video screen at the end of the the main panel, you'll see rough cuts from the documentary. And some of the I was watching some of the interviews this morning. Uh, Did you there, see Susan Rock? Yes. Yeah. yeah, she is fantastic. But she's so articulate. You she know, is. When Steve died, I think she was one of the few interviews on NPR, and it was just she's just. One of the best Talk thing, about her because not everyone yeah. in the audience may know. Susan Rockrise was handpicked by Steve and convinced to join Next from Esprit because she was working with one of the great consumer retail store geniuses, uh, Doug Tompkins, and he wanted to know everything about that. It was already kind of preliminary for the Apple store, so that was her expertise. She became very close to Steve and uh, has a lot of passion and things to say, but one of the great things she says about the creation of, of user, simple, you know, graphical user interface and, and humanist tools is that it allows people to express their truth, she says. It almost allows them to scream their truth and you've unleashed this creativity on the world through these tools. That's leveraging our, our brains, you know, mm. it's the Engelbart vision. So mm -hmm. she articulates a lot about what's exciting that no one can really say. So this is really cool stuff and people I think are talking to me because that you know, I have the relationships from those days, and the, and you know, I have an, I have I've been trusted. So I think I'm getting good stuff, and I'm also let I'm adding to the history, the understanding of the history of that time through these interviews. So I think that'll be good. Are you starting with the photographs when you go interview someone? Yeah. What what kind of, what sort of reactions are you getting from them when they see these images? Well, Samir, when he looked, he said, "I don't even remember you being in the room." And I was like, "That's yes, good. Yes. Yeah. Because I practiced becoming invisible." Mm. That was part of my thing. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of times... Do they get emotional at all? Do yeah, they, they do. Yeah. Sometimes, sometimes people deny the reality of what happened. You know, there's always going to be a spin to history. Yeah. Um, or that maybe they remember it differently from the They remember the it differently, and I'm open to that. I think I just have to present all the information, and, you know, it's a... I'm always going to have to take the position that I'm a witness, and this is my subjective, what I saw. And uh, to the best of my ability, this is what I understood. And that's why I think, for me, the documentary becomes even more important to try to complete the picture, if you mm. will. It's not mm. just the still photo. Mm. Anyone who goes through revolution, our big 
exhibit oh, downstairs fantastic. will see that one of the deep beliefs we had about building that exhibit is that every image had to have a caption that told some history. It really needed to say what the image was and why it was important. And one of the things I was so delighted about when I saw the exhibit were those wonderful captions Thank that you. you've written for picture after picture. How, when did you commit to that? Because it would have been very easy <laughs> to do a lot less than you did, and there's a lot of history there. I, it took a year to write those, and it was hell because I'm not a writer. But I once, I wrote them originally for the Russian exhibition because the curator there said, we are Russian, we read. <laughs> I was like, I've read Tolstoy. I don't, you know. so, so I was like, really? I took, I, that kind of started the ball rolling. So I began writing and I, I did an oral thing first and then I worked on it and I got her a set of captions, and damn if that wasn't true. The, the booth was packed at the Moscow Photo Biennale with people reading my captions. The other photographers got upset because they weren't leaving my booth. <laughs> <laughs> so that started it. Then when I got the book contract from Atria Books from Simon & Schuster, they, the editor was like, and of course you're gonna have to write this. And I'm like, no, I thought we would hire a writer. And he's like, no, you're gonna write the captions. And I'm like, but, so that, we had to get a researcher and really go deep on it and yeah. try to really, triangulate a lot of that, and we're still finding out things that are, are different, especially with technical stuff. But I appreciate you saying that. that it was a very hard thing to do. Thank mm, you. Mm. The reaction around the rest of the world, what, what's it been? A lot of 20-somethings, really mm. excited. I didn't expect this, John, but this is really cool. Even at TEDx in Boston, or at, uh, I mean, there was a young man from Sudan who came out with tears in his eyes and hugged me. And, a lot of young entrepreneurs came and said, you know, we go to see all these talks, but you were in the room, you saw this stuff, and um, it made it real for them. Mm -hmm. and, but, but also, young people come up and they even, they're tech people. They don't know who Bob Noyce is. They don't know any of their own history. I'm talking about engineers mm -hmm. who are brilliant. They don't know their history. They don't know what happened, and so they're really excited to connect the dots and see that it matters what happened then, because they're building on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. Just like the people in the 80s, we're building on the shoulders of all those that came before Turing and Professor Terman and Shockley and all the Intel guys. So they find the history to be really relevant. They're starting to, and that's yeah. the most important reaction I'm getting. Yeah. Because believe me, for years, actually in Silicon Valley, a lot of people, I, I would exclude this crowd, but a lot of people I've talked to over the years out here are like, yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Who cares? Forget your stupid project and try to inspire the next generation. We're putting all our money in India and China and we're on to the next deal, goodbye, good luck. And that's actually a true thing. There's a lot of people who are focused on the next thing. They don't want to look back. And, I, and that's valid because it's hard sure. to do this. I just think you gotta study the past if you're gonna have the best future. Churchill, wasn't it? Yeah, <laughs> something like that, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, that actually is an interesting point because you, you started to talk about this and I, I'd like to explore this with you a little bit more and it's that you do see this as a through line to the future. You, you, you have this conviction that you're not simply talking about all these events that happened from, from 15 to 30 years ago. You're talking about things that are just relevant today. And so how are you, how are you imparting that message and why do you believe it so deeply? Well, you know, just talk about job creation. I know it's not the job of Silicon Valley to create jobs, but we gotta do something. There's 25 million people that are never gonna get jobs again. And I saw it's the Stanford D School, they're developing double bottom line businesses that are sustainable, it's not this rocket ship ride. And they think about employees. You know, when David Packer and, and Hewlett started their company and when these older companies began, they were part of the fabric of the community. Their employees paid property tax on the houses they bought that supported fire and police. And there was a relationship between the employees to the world they lived in. And then companies all became global and, and then of course with startups and apps, everything is about creating efficiencies. So it's hard to justify, oh, we're gonna add employees, <laughs> that's crazy. So I don't know the answer to that. But I do know the other piece of this is the absolute obsession and passion that I saw in those days. I think that's relevant to now and that's, I think that's how you create, like all the stuff that I talked about that's coming, mm -hmm. nothing has scaled yet, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing has scaled. It hasn't. Nothing has. It's all dabbling. 3D printing, it's coming. It's all exciting. Quantum computing, does it really exist? Ones and O's in the same time and place? I don't know. 
If you don't have people who have that obsession and that passion, if you don't support them with long-term money, if you don't have crazy investors like crazy inventors, you don't make the breakthrough. Also, you know, you're going to fail in spectacular ways if you follow my vision. <laughs> but that's got to be done. That has yeah. to be done. And maybe there needs to be more government incentives to lead the VCs so there's less risk. Mm. But I see, this is why I, I see it as a through line to the future because I met this young entrepreneur on a plane flying out here and I said, oh, tell me about your app, you know, and blah, blah, blah. And she's like, and I said, so is this the most exciting thing in your life? Is this define you? And she looked at me like, no, no, I'm just going to make money and then go to Bali and figure out what my life is about. Yeah. Uh. And that's very common, I find. A lot of the, that's why I said you need something you believe in to walk through the fire of invention. A lot of these young entrepreneurs, they can walk away. They don't have the commitment level. They don't have to. They can go back and live with their parents now. Mm. You know, the kids in the 80s and 90s, middle class can, kids. But that's no, another yeah. story. <laughs> well, <you're, laughs> but it's not a horrible thing either. It's in Brazil and Italy, that's normal. But, yeah. but I just feel like the kids, the stakes were higher. These were, right. by the way, these were middle class, for the most part, kids who went to middle class high schools in middle class America, and they were smart enough to get into Stanford and MIT, and they, and they started these companies here. Um, but they had the old American value of, you know, use it up, wear it out, or go without. They didn't feel they could go back home easily. They felt they had to succeed. They had to d die trying. So there's underlying values that I think we can learn from and, and bring back as well. Which, I'm, by the way, I'm very excited all this went global because most of my career is about culture and going into other cultures, and I'm really happy to see the world scale up around this technology as it did. But now we come back to the US and, and if you really look hard at stuff, you know, do, will we really ever grow an economy if we're not creating stuff that's sustainable and jobs? I don't know. Now that it's back in Silicon Valley, what do you hope people will take away from the show here? An interest in the history. Yeah. And just think about the lessons. I mean, probably anyone here in this room could tell me what lessons were more, more important than what I'm bringing up. Because you don't want to repeat those mistakes yeah. <laughs> if you could avoid it. Right. But I believe that passion is the key. And it's an intangible you can't put in a business plan. People say invest in the person, not the plan. But that's not really the case today as much, I think, because it's all about what's the idea that will scale faster as an app is where the investment goes. And I know you stay incredibly busy with the other work that you're doing. Every time I, I talk to you, you're, you're shooting for Vanity Fair or Forbes or Fortune or someone yes. really exciting. How much of the ongoing work of trying to digitize and curate and extract more from this project are you, are you able to do? And how much do you want to do? Well, funny you should ask that, because my dream is to create a platform with this that can be a new model. Like, photographers are struggling now. The digital technology invented by my friends has destroyed the trade practices of my industry. <laughs> <laughs> And we need a new model. And I think if you have a good story, a core story, you can create a book, you can create a film, you can create an education program, a traveling exhibition. So my dream is to get funding and create partnerships and grow this into something that becomes almost a movement about this idealism and, and the values that I'm talking mm, about. Mm. And, and to go onward with it, because you could have fearless geniuses from education, fearless geniuses in politics, fearless geniuses in sports, whatever. It's about being bold and going after tough ideas and taking risks. That's the core of this community, mm, of this mm, culture, mm. and that's exciting to me. Because life is short. <laughs> <laughs> well, this hour has flown okay. by, totally flown by. Thank you. And we're so happy to have you here, and, and your project is just brilliant. And we want you to sign a million books in the next oh, hour, thank OK? Thank you. We got to sell All books. All right, thanks. People. We got to sell books. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, John.